You read Walther. What, what made Walther write this? Yes. I, I, mean, I have a more to like on that question. Okay. <laughs> what of this did I he write? I expect nothing less. And what of this did he just copy? Well, paste? I'm getting there. <laughs> I'm getting there. Copy and paste. Like, is there anything he wrote? That wasn't here? available yet. Well, okay. it's loose. All right, we'll get there in a minute. What prompted him to write this? Why did Walter sit down and say, I think I'll write a book on church and ministry? Why? Yes. Very valid. And the, the whole Buffalo Synod pastors are the only. All right. So we have some big stuff going on at the time. Let's get back to our context again. We got this whole Buffalo Synod and this guy named Grabow. Okay. What else do we have going on in Walter's life, which is probably even more pressing? Well, you mentioned in class that the bishop is on the other side of the river, and yes. so was church. We've just exiled our bishop. Are we church? In fact, anybody heard of the thing called the Altenburg debate? Okay, so what was that? Whether or not we should go back to Germany or stay here. All right, whether or not we should go back to Germany or whether we should stay here. And more theologically driven, it was about... Are we church, are we church? Are we church or not? What makes church church? And Walter argued, we're church because we have the means of grace, because we are church, we are the priest of God, we're the church. And the other side was arguing, we're not church without a bishop, and the authority comes from on top. So the Allenberg's debate was kind of a debate between the top-down guys and the bottom-up guys, and who won? Well, the bottom-up guys, it would seem, if we're going to go with our clean, clean debate. And so church and ministry, Kirk and Amt, is the result of that debate. It's basically Walther's whole argument in print. So we can thank Stefan for Kirk and Amt. Because he precipitated it, okay? So that's with context. So it's not like just this kind of idle thing that popped up that, I think I'll write a book about this. It, he, there was a pressing need. Now, the reason this is relevant is it speaks to Caleb's wry observation, which was noted by many of you. So you read through the whole book, and the first question I'll ask you is, how much did Walter actually write? You're struck by this. Okay, what is, what is his standard MO? He's doing this classic disputation style, okay? So he's got his list of theses, like 95, only no, he doesn't have that many, and he breaks them into two halves. He's got theses on the church, and he's going to have theses on the office of the ministry, all right? And then, so he lays down his theses all laid out for us, then he says, okay, here we go, thesis one, boom, lays it out. And then what you do, he kind of explains the situation, and then he starts marshalling his evidence. Right? Standard MO. So how does the evidence list go? It's the same every time. How's it go? Scriptures first. Confessions are next. And then others. And then the supporting church fathers. And who's always the first church father? Luther, of course. And then you go from Luther to the lesser luminaries, like Christostom and Ambrose and Augustine. And, you know, they're just way down the list. Yeah. Which, and it's, it's a little funny, but it's, it's, it shows you where Luther stands. I mean, Luther is the father of the church now, and he's the one they quote. And so this is what, Luther, what Walter's doing. Now, that ends up being the case that of these 300-some pages in this book, if you started taking out everything that is in quotation marks or is pulled from somewhere else, or cut and paste, as Caleb, you know, put it. What's left? The first four pages? Nah, it's a little more. I kind of figured this out one time. It's about 27 pages. <laughs> yeah, not, over 90% of this book is just pulling quotes. Talk about trying to get permissions when you're published. Man, what a headache that would be. So, this is just, he, he's just basically pulling all this material in. Now, is that a smart thing for him to do, this debate and trying to persuade people? What do you think of this M.O.? Why is he doing this? I mean, that's, to me, that's smart. You're, you're quoting people that everybody already respects and understands and agrees with. Yes! Yeah. Yes! Yeah. yeah. Just to make sure that it's not your own opinion. This is precisely the point. Now, he, he is trying to make the case, listen, guys, this is what the church has taught. This is not Walter talking here. It's not some weird splinter group of Saxon immigrants living in Missouri. This is the church talking here. 
And the church has said these things. And who speaks for the Lutheran church? Well, Luther does. And the confessions do, and the scriptures do. And then all the other people you can line up. Now, is there any precedent for this way of operating? Any examples you can think of? How about Chemnitz? Remember reading Two Natures in Christ? How much does he go around quoting church fathers? Piles of it. How about the confessions themselves? Does Melanchthon quote anybody in the Apology? Do the formulators quote anybody in the Formula of Concord? Like crazy. Now, again, what's the MO in the confessions? It's trying to make the case. Look, guys, we're not making stuff up. We're not starting a new church because we're tired of the Pope. We're not just pulling stuff out of thin air. In fact, and this gets back to my argument I was making last time, we're being apostolic because what we teach is in line with what has always been taught. Prosper of Aquitaine is not so far off here. What has been taught everywhere in all places at all times. That Prosper is that. Get my guy. No, it's a different guy. No, no, that's right. Um, I, I should have prepped on that one. Anybody have one? What? Vincent of, uh, What's that? Vincent of Laurent. Yes, that's right. Vincent of Laurent. St. Laurent. That's right. Thank you. Prosper of Aquitaine is um, the Lex Rondi, Lex Credendi. All right. Yes, Vincent Laurent is the one who says what has been taught always, everywhere, by all times, in all places. This is it. And so in other words, there is a consistency. There's a consistency with what we teach, and that's why the Lutherans would claim, hey, we're the church. We're apostolic here. We're not making something up. We're not some kind of weird splinter. This, guys, is such an important concept for you to grasp in the world in which we're living today. Because so many people have this idea that, you know, Lutherans, you just kind of follow Luther. You made yourself up in 1517, and that's your heritage. No, 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 no. We are the church. And you need to get this. It's important to kind of grasp this, and it's important to see how we then have a responsibility to the wider church. It, so many things grow out of this. It's a good concept to get in. So Walter is being faithful with that. Now, what you get then here is a whole bunch of quotations and a little Walter here and there. And so then you've got to kind of sort out what's Walter saying and what's he doing. But obviously, he's the one taking all the quotes, pulling them and editing, and making them say a certain thing. And what he's saying is what we're going to try to get at here. James. Uh, to follow up on him copying and pasting, yeah. it's, I guess what's more startling is not that he's quoting, but he <coughs> talks so little about what he's uh, quoting. Like yeah. confessions, uh, scripture quotes. I mean, to unpack it and to explain what this all means. Just, he doesn't bother. He just, there you have it. Self explanatory. That's kind of the idea. You know, who's going to argue? All right. So. Let's get into this. Um, there's a lot we can talk about. And there are some, several things I think are important, so we'll talk about those. And um, if you guys have, have things you think are important, we'll try to get to those as well. But there's a lot going on in here. But I want to make sure we understand kind of the main big thrust of this. And the biggest thrust of the question really gets back to where we left things hanging last time, which is when it comes to who has the authority in the church, where does it lie? Okay, so we would say you basically have these kind of two choices. You can say that Christ gives his authority to his chosen leaders. And so then we would have the Pope, or if you don't like that, you can just go with a bishop. And then the bishop gives it to the priest. And then the priest eventually would give it to the people. And you can make a lot more steps in here down the way. But the whole point is it's all top down and the people are on the receiving end. And for sake of clarity, we can call this an hi a hierarchical way of looking at things. Or you might call it an Episcopalian, because of the Episcopus, the idea of the bishop in there. But the term I'm going to use most of the time is, I'm just going to call this clericalism. Because clericalism gets at the idea, it's the clerics that have the power. Okay, So this is the term I will use most of the time is clericalism. All right, now on the other side, we have the idea that Christ gives his authority to the people, the whole church, the whole priesthood of believers. And so they are the ones who have the keys. And then they, for the sake of convenience, for the sake of clarity, for the sake of we don't want chaos, they deputize their pastor. And so the pastor has his authority in a derived sense via the people, and in effect, they, in a sense, you could say, loan their authority to him. And that's why this idea of being deputized kind of really nails it. 
You know, you have to form the posse, so suddenly the shopkeeper becomes a deputy, you slap a star on him, he gets his shotgun and off he goes on his horse, all right, because he's been deputized, all right? And so it's the same idea. He's got no inherent authority, it's just he's got his authority derived from the people, and so now he acts in their stead, all right? And that would be the other sense. Now, that will call, for the sake of clarity, congregationalism. Because in this way of looking at things, it is the congregation that has all the authority, and the pastor's authority is derived only from the congregation. Okay? Now, we can slap some names up here. Okay? In Walter's day, and this is the context we're going to deal with, who was pushing this side? Well, Mike already mentioned this guy named Grabau, okay? And Grabau was not even a Lutheran. He wasn't part of the Perry County guys. He was one of these Lutherans who were already here, part of this Buffalo Synod. But the Lutherans were making connections with other Lutherans, and this guy was leaning heavy on this clerical understanding. That's where he was coming from, okay? So he was having a clericalist attitude. And there's another key representative who was even closer to Walter, and who would that be? Leah. Leah. That's right. Okay? And this became significant because William Leahy, who's back in the old country, he is pushing hard for a clericalist view. And that's where he is coming from. And in fact, if you were paying attention in your Marquardt reading last time, at the end of the chapter on the, in the, in the ministry, he puts in a footnote that it's a little embarrassing to admit it because we like Leahy so much. And man, don't we, they all, we all love Leahy, you know, Leahy, 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 you know, all awesome dude, and he did a lot of cool things. But it's a little embarrassing to admit that he had some problems that were a little clerical. And even Marquardt has to reluctantly admit it, as much as he likes Leahy, because, and he points out in the footnote, that for Leahy, it was an open question whether or not a, anybody who was not ordained could even give a, or, a word of forgiveness. Pretty, pretty serious. And so Leahy is coming down solidly in this kind of a clerical camp. That's where he's pushing. Now, there are people on this side, though, too. All right? And we have some representatives, like in the Wisconsin Senate, who kind of fall in here. And a guy named Heineke falls into this, and there are a few others. We'll come up with some names as we move along here. There aren't as many like, key people in this group, but there are a few that kind of take this position. But the question we have to ask ourselves, then, is where does Walter come down? That's the question we're supposed to be asking. And if I had asked you this question two weeks ago before we, we talked about any of this stuff, what would you have answered me without even hardly, hardly hesitating? You'd say, boom, CFW, there he is, done. Now we can move on. Okay, next question, this is boring, and we're just flying along. But I've been making you second guess stuff, right? And making you say, wait a minute, stop, slow down, let's ask what's really going on here. Is the congregational view really what's, what the deal is? Is this really what Walter's up to? And that's what we have to be asking ourselves. Is this the choice? Now, in a lot of circles in the LCS, LCMS today, this is still often pitched as, this is the choice. And like we do with so many things in our theology, we reduce it to a zero-sum game. Okay, remember that from Systems 1? Remember that idea of a zero-sum game? So everything has to zero out, zero balance, like we're back to our chemistry, you know, acid balance with the, with, the, with the base and trying to get it all zeroed out. Same idea of the zero-sum game. So if we're going to give power to the people, what's that mean to the pastor? His goes down. And if, on the other hand, we give power to the pastor, what's that mean to the people? Theirs has to go down because there's only so much power out there. So you've got to strike the balance and you've got to get the zero-sum game and balance it all out. People operate this way all the time. And it's sort of like, are we going to slide this way, or are we going to slide this way? Well, how are we going to do this? Where's the answer? Now, this gets complicated, because we're not just talking about Luther, or I mean Walter in the 19th century. We're also talking about our church today in 2016, and how we got here, and some of the influences in the last few years. When I was a student here, a long time ago, in the late 20th century, more specifically the early 80s, middle 80s, when I was here as a student, the pendulum was clearly swinging over here. And in fact, in the 70s, this was when everyone was a minister, and the Fuegt had published this book, Everyone a Minister. Don't bother putting a copy of it on my podium. I've had that happen every quarter, almost that I've taught this class, so don't bother. Um, Foyt shows up, and every, every time some pastor discards his library, there's always a couple of copies of Foyt in it for some reason. Everybody was buying it in the 70s, so I've got plenty of it. Don't bother. But he published a book, Everyone a Minister, 
And he's clearly over here. Hey, we're all doing ministry. Everybody here is a minister. And you see this in bulletins even, sometimes still to this day. Ministers at St. Paul's, everyone, pastor, Pastor Joe. And so there you have it. See, we're all ministers here. We're all doing ministry. That's a congregationalist attitude. And this was just running the show in the 70s and the early 80s in the LCMS. Now today, we've got a few voices who are saying, you know, that has some problems because scripturally it doesn't seem to add up, confession doesn't seem to add up, and it also has a problem of actually sort of diminishing the office. So now we're getting some voices who are kind of pulling back this way and wanting to reassert the pastor a little bit. But often they do that at the expense of the people by saying things like, only the pastor can give forgiveness of sins. Only the pastor can deliver the gospel. And you can pray for them, and you can pay for me, but I've got to do the work. And that idea is out there. And it's actually being said by some people. And so this seems to be the choices we have, here or here. And where are we going to put Walter? Does he belong here or not? So we're going to be looking at the text saying, where does Walter actually come down? All right, James. I was just curious if uh, that movement in the 70s uh, related to greater cultural themes. Of, of course. Like the power. Or? Of course, of course, of course. Church is never in isolation. It's all about... And we just are usually about 10 years behind. And so the country goes through its con conflagration in the 60s. We do ours in the 70s. So, you know, it's about, it's about right. Oh, we want to do that too. You know, so it is. And so it's the, it's the really annoying little brother syndrome. And it's so, so trivializing when the church tries to mimic the world 10 years behind. It's just so annoying. And that applies on so many things including worship style, but more on that later. All right. <coughs> All right. Shall we move forward then? So he's got his theses laid out, and he's got nine theses on the church, and then he's going to have a nice balance, ten theses on the office of the holy ministry. Okay, and that's where he's going to go. So let's just kind of crank through this stuff and see what he's up to. Some of these spend, we need to spend more time on than we do others, and we'll hit some highlights along the way. So I'm just going to start flipping pages. Let's go. So, first of all, the thesis one, page 27. And do you guys all have this, the old edition? Anybody have the new um, updated Harrison edited edition? Some of you do. All right. And what you'll discover is the new big edition that costs a ton more money that was just recently published that Harrison edited um, is the exact same translation with Harrison's footnotes. And that's all it is. <laughs> <laughs> what do we say about plagiarism? What's that? What do we say about plagiarism? About plagiarism? No, it was, it was up front. Oh, okay. CPH did it all. It's all good. It's okay. <laughs> but it, it's, it's not, and that's why I don't assign that textbook because it's not that significantly different. That's my point. And this creates some interesting things, though, when we get to some, especially some sticky parts we'll get to. All right, so the first thesis, the church in the proper sense of the term is the congregation, the gemeinde, the gathering of saints. That is the aggregate of all those who are called out of the lost and condemned human race by the Holy Spirit through the word, truly believe in Christ and by faith are sanctified and incorporated in Christ. So there we have, that's the church. And then the first page and a half is all Walther. And then away he goes, starts quoting. So there's not much to add there. Pretty straightforward, and that's good. And then he gives all of his witnesses. Second thesis, also pretty straightforward, not much to add onto that. And that's simply the... Um, point he makes, this is now page 34, that to the church in the proper sense of the term belongs no wicked person, no hypocrite, no unregenerate, no heretic. And we've already talked about that. All right. So then the third church in the proper sense of the word is invisible. We've talked about that. Church is visible. Church is invisible. I've covered that enough. I don't want to get bogged down on that anymore, even though that's really, really important. Now we're getting to things that's just a tad more interesting. Yes, James? Quick on third. It sounds like it's contrary to what you were saying the other day. Mm, no, no, no. Proper sense is that's the real church. Now, what he's admitting, though, is, and he, he makes the point, that there are times that we'll use church a little loosely, and what we mean is this bunch of people gathered here at this particular location that is potentially having some hypocrites in it. But they're not really church. That's why he says proper. That's why he says proper sense. And that's why it's getting at. I'm just dropping off the adjective proper and saying the church, and I want to use church in its robust term, always. So the church is the people of God, where the means of grace are going on. For Thesis 2, yep. um, do you think uh, there's a problem with the, the symbol and this particular thesis? 
In yeah. what sense? Are people falling in and out of grace and falling in and out of the church because they've sinned and now they're hypocrites? Oh, I know Walter gets pegged on that and he gets kind of, he gets, gets, people get stirred up in his law gospel on that too. I don't have a problem with that at all. I don't, I don't think it's an issue. I think um, what you have going on there, frankly, and this gets into a whole other animal, but it's worth thinking about in another time. What you have really going on there is Walter is just a bunch more pious than people thought he was, and he really expected people to act like it and behave like it. And his point is, when somebody is not acting like a Christian, then guess what? They're probably not. Now, that's a true statement. But of course, the sticky part is, at what point does intentional, deliberate sin translate into Holy Spirit's driven out? That's the sticky part. And Walter doesn't explore that much, and he makes people nervous by even suggesting it, but he's not the first one to suggest it. Um, Luther kind of did, and so does St. Paul, and so does St. John. You know, sin doesn't exist with faith. St. John's pretty explicit on this in 1 John. So what's going on here is this. It's very simple. Does willful, intentional sin drive out the Holy Spirit? Yes or no? Yes. 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 All right. Now, the problem we have, of course, is every one of us knows that every time we sin, we kind of knew we were doing it. And it kind of feels willful. So that starts to kind of freak us out. Like, well, I willfully cheated last week. So did I drive out the Holy Spirit? And now I'm repentant and the Holy Spirit comes back to me? Oh, phew. And that's the whole idea of in and out of grace. And that kind of freaks us out. And I'm not suggesting that because we do function always in grace, always in forgiveness, in spite of our willful sin. And yet the reality is that we can intentionally, willfully sin to the point that we harden ourselves and drive the Spirit out. It happens. Luther was sure that when David was up to his eyeballs and sinned with Bathsheba and Uriah and hiding the whole thing, where was the Holy Spirit? Gone. Gone. That was Luther's interpretation. And again, we don't like this because we are saturated in our gospel reductionistic thinking as Lutherans that we don't want to deal with sin like that. We don't want to think the law actually bites. We just want to say, no, it's all gospel, it's all good, don't sweat. You know, sin, 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 it's all great, there's always forgiveness. Which is true, but it's also true that you can drive out the Holy Spirit, which is a very dangerous thing, as the writer of Hebrews tells us. And you don't monkey around with this. So, at some point, when a person says, I'm just going to do what I want to do, to heck with you and your gospel, to heck with God and his will, I don't care. At some point, the Holy Spirit is clearly driven out. Now, the timing on that is always rather nebulous. We don't know. Neither do we get to sit in judgment and say, uh, the Holy Spirit just left. I saw him go. Now, Ezekiel can do that with the Spirit of God at the temple, but we don't get to do that with people's hearts. But we know it happens because Scripture tells us. And we are even able to make the judgment that it has happened. That's what excommunication is. More on that in a few weeks. You can just wait anxiously for that. So I would say, I think Walter gets a bad rap when people try to jump on it. I just, when we uh, talked about different denominations and their incorrect theologies, mm -hmm. we would say that they were heretics and to a degree. So then, are they no, not, not heretics or heterodox? Okay. Big difference. Big difference. Yeah. Now, heretics means you're going to hell. Heterodox, you're just kind of goofed up. <laughs> Seriously, there's a big difference. We'll talk about that later, too. No, other Christians are heterodox. They're not heretics. Heretics are going to hell. Big difference. Don't call people heretics. Okay, I'm really sorry. My bad. All right. No problem. I'm not. Well, you know, I'm just saying in general. So don't call people heretics unless they are. All right. All right. <coughs> Page 52. Now, this is where things start getting interesting. First full paragraph. This is Walter talking. From this we learn that the doctrine of our church is that of the Word of God. Namely, that Christ has given the ministry and all gifts and powers procured by Him, just as the Gospel, immediately to the church, as their original and primary possessors, that the church possesses the ministry, etc., not immediately, that is, Christ having granted it to certain persons, who should continue in the ministry for the benefit of the church. The reverse is true. The church does not have the ministry immediately through official persons, but the official persons have the ministry immediately through the church, which as the communion of believers and saints possesses this and all their prerogatives. Whew. What does that sound like he's saying? Who's got the authority? Is it sounding congregational or clerical? Yes. Well, in this case, this paragraph only, what's it sounding like? It's here. Done. Slam dunk. Close the book. We're done. I mean, there you have it. It's, that's just it. Now, what you also need to notice here, and pay attention to this, is you get a fair, fair amount of square bracket editing, editing going on in this book. 
Okay? And they threw in the word here immediately in the third to last line of that paragraph. It's in square brackets. Whenever you read something in square brackets, what does it typically mean? It was put in by the editor. The editor thought he needed to put that in for clarity. Whenever you're reading theology, pay attention to square brackets stuff because it often means that the editor is putting in a little interpretation, a little spin. And so what you need to do is read it without the square brackets and see if it changes anything. Okay? So if you read it without, he says, the official persons have the ministry through the church. Okay, and so immediately it's putting kind of a finer point on it. It just says they have the ministry through the church, and it's a little bit less pointed without the square brackets. So just kind of notice that there. All right, so I'm quite willing to grant, there you have it. Walter's making a strong case. They don't have it immediately through persons, but they have it immediately, which means without any process, straight from God himself. Why would Walter want to drive this point home? What's his context? You don't need a... You don't need a Stephan. You don't need a bishop. This is what he's driving at. Now, and remember, he is pushing hard against this side. And I, I'm not trying to skew everything, but I do think we need to pay attention to the historical context. If you take Walter and just lift him out of his context and just drop him into the 21st century, he doesn't make a lot of sense. But you put him in his context, realizing he's fighting against Leahy and Grabau and all the Stephan sympathizers, or not Stephan, but bishop sympathizers, in his own midst. He's got to push hard and make his case because, and let's admit this as well, the default position of the immigrants coming over from Saxony is not this one. The default position is this one. This is where they're coming from. This is where they're going from. This is what they've all been used to. This is their default position. This is the new idea. So in fact, if you were at the Allenberg debate, who was pushing the conservative position, Walther or the other guy? The other guy is pushing the conservative position because that's what we've always done. Walther's coming up with the new thought. But his point is, it's not a new thought, and that's the argument he's trying to make here. Uh, how much of the mentality of congregationalism is because of the American individualism? Wow, well, that's not immaterial, is it? Um, Mark Rod's going to talk about that, and he tries to downplay it. I tend to enhance it. I think the, um, the democratic spirit that was kind of you know, in the air in this new world, man, it's, got, it's happening. And this is it's one of the reasons they came over here. And the whole democratic idea, the populist, I mean, which one of these two is democratic? There's no doubt about it. This is the democratic way. Hey, we're all equals. This smacks of monarchy. This smells like a king. And if you're an American, you don't want anything to do with this. In fact, this is one of the reasons why the Catholics were so derided when they first started immigrating like crazy in the 19th century, coming in, in droves. Why were they so, people so afraid of them? Who'd they take their orders from? Pope. Oh, oh. It's like we're getting a king back. We don't want that. And even in the 60s, when JFK was elected, people were really concerned. Oh, is he taking orders from the Pope? First Catholic president? I don't know. And so this is the, clearly the American position. No doubt about it. Yeah. I don't know. Well, then, knowing that many of the motives and drives behind that enlightenment individualism of the American spirit, um, do we need to revisit <coughs> and say, well, perhaps, although he has solid proof and uh, foundation, is wrong and that it actually serves for a lot of detriments to have the congregation. Well, we, that's what we're getting to. Actually, that's where I'm kind of going with all this. Yes. All right. <laughs> yep. All right. Top of 54, little Luther quote, the keys do not belong to the Pope as he lies, but to the church, that is to the people of Christ, the people of God, or the holy Christian people, as far as the world extends, or wherever there are Christians. For they cannot all be at Rome unless first the whole world will be at Rome, which will not happen for a long time. And so he's going on here. Now what he's saying is the keys belong to the whole church, which is a little different than saying that the church has the ministry. And so we have to be careful here now and also is, what do we mean exactly by ministry? And are we meaning ministry in some sort of generic sense or in a specific sense? And there's a big difference. And that's why when I was talking a couple of days ago, I was pounding hard on the office of the Holy Ministry, predict umpt. That's ministry in the narrow specific sense. Ministry in the wide generic sense would mean just doing the gospel. Okay? And this would be co-worker telling his buddy about how much Jesus loves him and how he can help him through his trials that he's having. That's the, that's, is that the keys? 
It is. Um, how about a mother telling her five-year-old son, yes, you stole a cookie, I love you, I forgive you, and Jesus forgives you too. Can she do that? Yes. Is that the keys? Yes, yes it is. Okay, that's wide ministry. Okay, so we're having to be careful here about what we mean, what's going on here. So when Luther says that all Christians have the keys, he's talking the wide sense. And it's interesting that he doesn't even use the word ministry here in this discussion. And see, I think it's intentional on Luther's part because Luther's not equating these. There's a difference here. So keys is kind of sense wide ministry. And for the sake of clarity in our English context, maybe we shouldn't even talk that way. Maybe we should just say the keys have been given to the priests because they are the right possessors of them. But the office of the ministry then is kind of a different thing altogether. And we'll see where this kind of unfolds as we move forward. All right, so let's go on. Um, bottom of 56 then. This is about the last five lines. And this is from the same, which means more Luther. Um, the church indeed has the right and power of the keys, but their use belongs to the bishops. Now that's very interesting. Okay? That is frivolous talk that of itself falls by the wayside. Christ gives to every Christian the power and use of the keys when he says, Let him be to you like a heathen, who is meant by you. Whom does Christ address with the little pronoun you? Perhaps the Pope? No, he speaks to every Christian in particular. So who's got the keys? Every single believer. This is clear from Luther, and we need to make sure we're clear on this. So every single believer has the keys. Everybody does. Okay? Good. Got that. So let's move on here. And now we go to page 70 and following, and this is just a little sidebar, but this is really worth thinking about because this is going to pop up again later for us. I talked to you last time about the marks of the church, and I said that traditionally we are how many marks in the church? Yeah, I told you three and a half, right? So we have the word and we have sacrament. Those are the marks. And so you get three and a half by going preaching, baptism, Lord's Supper, and absolution. All right? And so that's what the church is. When those things are going on, you got yourself the church. So that's what we're ready for. And in fact, you will frequently hear Lutherans say things like, well, you know, the Reformed make a big mistake because they count church discipline as a mark of the church, and it's clearly not. And they make a big mistake. You ever heard that? You haven't? Oh, you, you will. All right. Now, what's interesting, though, so now here we have Luther talking about the marks of the church, and he starts on page um, 71 and following. So at the very bottom of 71, he says, in the first place, so in the first place, he's going to list off where, you, where is the church. This Christian holy people is to be recognized from the place where there is the holy word of God. That, however, is not found everywhere in the same way. So what's the first mark of the church? Word of God. All right, good. Bottom of 72. Second mark of the church. Second, God's people, or the Christian holy people, is recognized by the holy sacrament of baptism, where it is rightly taught, believing you, according to Christ's institution. Cool? Word, baptism. Third, top of 73, God's people, or the Christian holy people, are recognized by the holy sacrament of the altar, wherever it is administered, believed and received, according to Christ's institution. Good. All right. Fourth. Whoa, wait. Four? Fourth. Page 73. God's people, or the Holy Church, is recognized by the keys, which it publicly, that is, use, it uses publicly, that is, as Christ commands, namely, that if a Christian sins, he should be reproved, and if he refuses to make amends, he should be bound and excommunicated, but if he repents, he should be absolved. Huh, sounds like church discipline to me. So what's the fourth mark of the church, according to Luther? Church discipline. Whoa! Huh. Oh, we're not done. Page 74. Fifth, the church is outwardly recognized by the fact that it calls and ordains ministers of the word or that it has offices that it should fill. If then you see that, you should be sure there is a good church and a Christian holy people. So what is a, what's the fifth mark of the church? The office. the office of the holy ministry. That's what he means. So in other words, churches have pastors. And this is going to become an axiom before we're done, that a church without a pastor is not possible. Churches have a pastor. Fifth mark of the church. Sixth, he's still not done. Sixth, God's people is outwardly recognized by public prayer to God as well as by praise and thanksgiving. Finally, what's he really talking about here? Worship. And we always all think that. 
Christians worship, right? That's how you know they're Christians. And now Luther admits it. Yeah, they worship. They act like Christians. And so now we got six. We may as well have seven to get a nice round, round of number because you can't end with six. So we come up with our perfectly rhetorically complete number of seven. Seventh, the holy Christian people is hourly recognized by the chastening affliction of the holy cross. In other words, they suffer. And so when Christians are suffering, Luther is all over this. So suffering is always a mark of faithfulness. It's a mark that you're the church. So when the church is enduring hardship, God's working there. That's the church. So Luther has seven marks of the church. So the next time you get some doofus in your winkle telling you, well, you know, church discipline is not a mark of the church, you say, well, according to Luther, um, it is. And um, he'll have interesting discussion, guaranteed. What's that? And now you have friends at the winkle. Yeah, yeah. And this is from, the, this is from his, his um, 1535 essay on the, on the church and its councils. So this is full blast mature Luther, 35. And this is the real deal stuff. So it's worth noting. All right, so that's our little sidebar. I don't want to overdo that, but that's what we're thinking about there. Now, let's go on. Let's go to um, page 78. And I already called your attention to this whole um, editorial thing. Check out what's happening on page 78 where they're quoting the Augsburg Confession. Now this is on thesis 6, which is, is in an improper sense, Scripture also calls the visible aggregate of all the called, proclaim the word, is good and evil church. All right, so there we have it. Now, page 78, although the Christian church properly is nothing else than the assembly of all believers and saints, nevertheless, since in this life many false Christians and hypocrites are in it, and even manifest sinners remain among the pious. Nevertheless, since our confession here declares the church in its proper sense is the only kind of sense, it attests at the same time communion embraces good and evil. So in other words, does it have evil people in it? And the translation here is kind of leaning toward it, has them in it. But if you look at Kolb Wengert, the German actually says, hypocrites are remaining, and the Latin says, mixed in with it, which actually nuances it quite a bit more. So are they in it, or they just appear to be in it? And the Latin and German are really kind of leaning towards the kind of appear to be in it. So just watch the editing. All right, now to page 88. Now we're getting a little more interesting, a little more important. So trying to answer the question, where is Walter going to come down? And so far we've got him over here. Page 88, I said. Page 88, right smack in the little page. And the sacrament, the Lord's Supper, baptism, etc., are not without efficacy. This is from the Apology. Pers um, or power because they are administered by unworthy or wicked persons. For these are not there because of their own person, but because of their call and because of Christ. As he attests, he who hears you hears me. Now, this is from the Apology being quoted. And this is an interesting quotation because it says, Why is the pastor there? Because of his own person? No. But because of their call and because of Christ. Which is interesting. So in other words, who wants that pastor there? Christ does. All right, so that's tending to kind of lean back the other side a little bit, I think. All right, now let's move on. So now we get to flip a whole bunch of pages and kind of leave the church behind and leave Walter kind of solidly in the camp of seeming to be a Congregationalist. And we're going to skip all the way up now to page 161, where we start into the other half of the theses. And this is where he gets into the Office of the Holy Ministry. Okay, anything on the first 160 pages you want to go back to? All right. Good. So, page 161, the Holy Ministry, Thesis 1, or pastoral office. So, this is his, he's using this term interchangeably for Walter here as it comes in English. The Holy Ministry or pastoral office. And if we're going to do German, we'd probably pick the nice, safe, explicit term, predictomt. The preaching office is an office distinct from the priesthood of all believers. All right. So now the first thesis he says is there's a difference between the priesthood and pastors. And we talk about this, and Walter's going to get into this. Luther likes to say, priests are born, pastors are made. So when is a priest born? At the fonts. Good Romans 6 imagery, all right? We're new birth of baptism, okay? So the priests are born at the font. Pastors are made. And so where are pastors made today? Seminary. At the seminary. Or distance ed through the seminary. All right. But the pastors are made. So there's a, there's a difference between a priest and a pastor. And that's what we're starting to get into now. All right. So now we're going to start thinking about what is it actually that makes a priest or a pastor a pastor. So we go to page 162. And we're going to hear from Luther. And we've got lots of Luther quotes to go now. <coughs> We're right in the middle of the incomplete paragraph. I'm about eight lines down the page. 
maybe 10, after the 1 Corinthians 14 text. There is a difference between administering a common right by the command of a congregation and using that right in an emergency. In a congregation in which everyone has the right, none should use that right without the will and appointment of the congregation. So in other words, who has the right to use the keys? Luther is going to argue everyone does, but not everyone should use them, which would seem to fit nicely with the idea that for the sake of order, we're going to deputize a few so we don't have chaos. Otherwise, everybody's going to come to church and say, I feel like preaching today. Well, all right, go for it, Mary. Um, no, we're not going to have that. We're going to have clarity and we're going to have order. Okay, now we go to the next quote, still on 162. You also lie so greatly in saying that I have made all laymen to be bishops, priests, and pastors, so that they may administer the office, holy ministry, without a call. But since you are so pious, you do not state that I added at once, let no one take on himself that office for which he is not called, except in an extreme emergency. All right, so in other words, no dude decides to go into the office. You don't self-appoint. And you don't say, the Holy Spirit is calling me. I'm a pastor. Never happens. You have to be put into the office. This is back to AC 14, right? No one preaches or does sacraments unless he is rite vocatus. That's what's going on here. Well, we have that. Okay, now we move then on. And we have great text um, stressing the authority of the priesthood. And don't ever get me wrong, people. Do priests, do the common people, have the authority to do uh, absolution and forgiveness of sins? The answer is yes, 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 yes. And this is pointing out here, this is Luther doing this, the story from Acts chapter 6 where you have Philip going off and proclaiming the gospel. And in fact, probably the best argument you'll ever find for why lay people can do the gospel is Acts chapter 6, right after the stoning of St. Um, Stephen. Because it says that after the stoning, after his death, a great persecution broke out in the church and all the believers were scattered except the apostles. So the twelve, the predictomped, stayed in Jerusalem and everybody else scattered. And then it talks about Saul breathing out threats. Then a few verses later it says, And those that were scattered went everywhere, keruxo, preaching, preaching. Now, wait a minute. Who was scattered? Everyone except the apostles. So, who was doing this preaching? Everybody. Everybody. So, when people say, you know, why was Philip preaching? It's because he was a deacon and no one else was there to preach. So, he did it. But was he in the office? No. Doesn't need to be. Any more than you need to be. And this is going to be one of the clear themes all the way through this. And this is kind of the, one of the ahas for for Walther. This is the linchpin of his whole argument. And he's got Luther solidly on his side on this. Every single believer has the keys. You have the authority. You are given the keys by God and you can speak the keys. So when the mother is saying to her child, I forgive you your sins and so does Jesus, is that legit? Is it as valid in heaven as if Christ himself had said it? It is. And when her friend says, Dude, you need to know about Christ and his love. Let me tell you about how much Jesus loves you. And he shares the gospel and that person becomes a believer. Is that legit? Yes. Is it the real gospel proclamation? Yes. It is. And when your brother comes to you in the dorm and says, Man, I really screwed up and I feel like an idiot. And I'm really messed up and I'm so, feeling so guilty. Do you have to say, well, let's go over to see Siva King. He can give you some absolution. Can you absolve him? And can you say, I forgive your sins? Christ forgive your sins? You are absolved. Can you do that? Yes, you can. You can. And in fact, you must. Because that's your position at that time. And we're going to get into this more as we move forward, but that's the whole point here. And when anybody tries to take that away from the priest because they're trying to pump up the, priest, the pastors again, they are running all over the top of Lutheran theology and all over Scripture. And they're wrong. Okay? Now, Having made that case, does that mean then that the pastor is really just the deputized dude who's there doing what everybody else could do? Not so fast. Okay? Not so fast. So let's be careful. Let's move on. All right. Um, go to page 164, the very bottom of the page. And Luther writes here, And this you must also firmly maintain, that no minister, no matter how pious or righteous he may be, dare preach or teach secretly the people of a papistic or a heretical, Peter, pastor, without the knowledge or consent of that pastor, for he is not commanded to do. 
Do you hear what he just said? You have a poor Catholic person who comes to you and says, I've been so beat up by the nuns all my life, and now I know the gospel. What are you obligated to do according to Luther? You've got to go check with that guy's priest and say, I've got one of your sheep. Is it okay if I take care of him? You have to, because you don't have any authority over that sheep. He belongs to another. That's what Luther says here. A papistic or a heretical pastor, you have no authority over them. You can't do that. You've got to check it out with them. That's crazy stuff. But now, page 165, we get the same kind of thing, middle of the page. And I'm just above the very halfway point. For God does not want to have anything done by our own choice or devotion, but everything only by his command or call, especially in the holy ministry. Thus, St. Peter says, knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, Christ, check this out, Christ also did not permit the devils to speak. Though they declared him to be the Son of God and proclaimed the truth, he did not want to permit such an example to preach without a call. So, why did Christ shut down the demons who were saying, You are the Son of God! Shut up, demon! You're not called. You don't have a call. You're not rite vocatus. You can't preach the truth. That's how Luther does with that text. Now, most of your exegetes probably are going to take some issue with that. But this is the move Luther is making here. And the point is this. It's fascinating to say, you know, how important is the call to Luther? How important is the authority that comes that I'm speaking on behalf of the call that I'm getting? How big a deal is this to Luther? It's huge. If you don't have a call, shut up. It's his point. And if you're not called to speak to a certain people, you shut up. He's consistent on this all the way through his, his work. Consistent all the time. Always does this. All right, good. Now we're still following Luther. I'm over to page 166. I'm at the very top of the page. Oh, I'm about 10 lines down. End of that first paragraph. If the pastor would not permit them, they would be excused before God and could shake the dust from their feet. For the pastor has charge of the pulpit, baptism, the sacrament, and the whole care of souls that is entrusted to him. But as it is, they intend secretly to oust the pastor together with all that is commanded of him. So they are real thieves and murderers of souls, blasphemers of Christ and of his church. Luther wrote several letters to people who were trying to get rid of their pastor, and he had no patience for this. None. Wouldn't put up with it. It's garbage. He had no patience for this. And so the pastor is put there by God. And when you try to start getting rid of your pastor, you're getting rid of the guy that God put there. Can't do that. All right, now we have one of my favorite Luther quotes. And you learn to just love Luther as you're learning theology. And this is a great Luther quote. And one of the best parts about Walter is he quotes so much Luther. So on the bottom of 169, last complete paragraph. And this is just vintage Luther. What a fine pattern that would be if a pastor would be preaching and everybody would have the right to interrupt and correct him. Then another might interrupt the two and tell them to keep quiet. After that, a drunkard might come in and interrupt the three, commanding also the third to shut up. Finally, also the women might claim the right, as those sitting by, to tell the man to hush up, and at last one woman would command the other. Oh, what a wonderful church turmoil, Billingsgate and racket that would be, and what pigsty would it not be more orderly than such a church? But the blinded sneaks do not consider this. They believe that they are the only ones sitting by and do not see that all the others have the same right and could bid them be silent. They do not know what it means to sit by or to speak, to be a prophet or layman, according to this passage of St. Paul. Now, I love this text because Luther is going through his progression of outlandish, horrible interruptions of the pastor. The, crown, the crowning indignity would be a woman claiming the right. <laughs> it's just... It's such great Luther. And people want to say, you know, Luther was very supportive of women's ordination. Yeah, right. Um, <laughs> <coughs> so, <clears throat> it doesn't fly. So, this is a great quote. But now, it's also really great because what's Luther's, Luther's point? Is there something about the pastor that puts him in a different category than the priests? And he is making the point, there is. And now we start getting attention again. Because we had just been really getting comfortable with, hey, we're all priests, we've all got the keys, we're all doing this, we can all, I can get up there and do the Lord's Supper. Come on, any dude can do it. Anybody can do it, because we all have the keys. All mine, I can do it. Now it seems like Luther is putting some distance. Now wait a minute, the pastor is the pastor. You don't get to say, hey, dude, up in the pulpit, I disagree with your interpretation of the text, and your illustrations are boring, give me a shot at that. No, absolutely ruled out. 
And not just because it's not seemly. There's more going on here, and that's the case he's going to make. Adam. To make sure I'm understanding correctly, I'm still a little stuck on the previous quote about the, uh, the heretical or even... Yeah, 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 yeah. So if a Methodist came to my congregation, I shouldn't talk to them about what we believe unless I first... I, I would say that if we're going to be... And I'm, I've actually, I do teach this, and I think this is something that has been poorly taught and poorly practiced in our own church, is that I would say that if somebody comes to you fleeing from a uh, heretical church or a heterodox church, that um, you should, at some point, before you receive him as a member, make contact with his pastor. And that's as a member, not necessarily before you have the conversation. No, no, I'm not saying you can't. Oh, I mean, I can't talk to you, dude. No, I mean, you can have conversation with him. But I think it's, it's part of the sense of, and this hits so many levels, it's a sense of honoring him as someone who's in the church, even if we don't agree with everything, and treating him as someone who is worthy of that. And it also teaches your own people a huge lesson about this is something that matters. Church membership is not an arbitrary thing. It's a significant thing, and you are member there. And you kind of are under that guy's authority, and I need to make sure it's going to be okay before we just run roughshod. That's appropriate. And I think, like I say, I think you teach some really huge lessons doing that. Imagine how shocked that Methodist pastor is going to be to get a phone call from you. Unless you actually go to the, the ministerial alliance and kind of know him, which would be a good thing too. See, there's a case to be made for that as well. All right, James? Um, I was just thinking about that. If, when you engage with the Methodist pastor, for example, mm. just you know, what, how would that engagement go? I mean, what would your, what would your... Well, I would probably say something like, hey, dude, is, I've got so-and-so coming to my church. I understand he was a member of your church. Oh, yeah. And I want you to know he's been worshiping here. Um, I'd like to know if it's okay with you if I continue to minister to him, or is there anything kind of unfinished business? Kind of what's the situation there? Okay. What do I need to know about? So more engaged just on that level as opposed to... Yeah, I'm, not, I'm not telling him off or, you know, letting him know, look, I got your guy. You know, um, it's, it's a matter of treating him with respect. And, you know, I just want you to know he's been worshiping here. And, um, you know, I would love for you to say, I'm glad for that. Take care of him. Um, if you won't, you know, I feel an obligation to provide for him. And he's got some issues here. Do, would it be helpful? I mean, and then you start getting into things like, the guy says, well, yeah, he's leaving, but not on good terms. Whoa, there's something you want to follow up on. Yeah, yeah. So and that's when you go back to your new guy and say, let's go talk. You go with them. Good. Go talk. Good. Okay. All right. Now, consistent with what Luther's building here now, check out this move on page 173. Because think about this logically. If everybody's got the keys, then who can do the Lord's Supper? Everybody. Makes sense. So we go to page 173, right in the middle of the page, and he writes, and if the tyrannical ministers will not administer to it to him, the Lord's Supper and his family, though they should do it, Yet he can be saved by his faith through the word. It should also give great offense to administer the. It would also give great offense to administer the sacrament here and there in the homes, and the end no good would come of it. For there will be factions and sects, and now the people as, are strange, and the devil is raging. Now, what's the context? The context is: suppose I'm a past a, a, a believer, and I believe in the Reformation evangelical teaching of gospel. But it turns out I'm attending a church where the priest is holding on to the old Catholic ways, and guess what? He won't commune me anymore. Now, where do I get the Lord's Supper? Oh, you just go join the Lutheran church down the road. No, it doesn't exist. This is, this is medieval Germany. You're stuck. So what are you going to do? So the, the answer, if someone would say, wait, I'm a priest. I'll just have the Lord's Supper at home with my family. And what's Luther's answer? No. No, you don't. Because you're not in the office, it's going to create more problems you don't do this. Now, this is not as weird as you might think. I actually had a, I, I was mentioning this once in a Bible class years ago in my parish, and I just mentioned in, in passing, you know, only the pastor does the office of the keys, and only he does the Lord's Supper, as AC 14 kind of stuff. And I had some guy say, oh, seriously? Now, we have a family reunion every year, and I, you know, 50, 60 people there, and I'm the kind of the pater familias, and I've always done the Lord's Supper for all of us as part of our family reunion. And I'm like, <laughs> inside I'm like, whoa, you got to be kidding me, dude. But I said, oh, <laughs> uh, you might want to rethink that. <laughs> it's like, oh, you got to be kidding me. That's nuts. But see, it's not so nuts when you start thinking about a, a really consistent congregational view. He, it's, he's right on track. Hey, I got the keys. Why not? And the answer is no, no, because you're not in the office. So now we're already starting to see 
some space kind of opening up here. Now things get really interesting when we press even further, where we go to page um, 177 and we get thesis 2. And this is probably the most important part of this whole argument. Thesis 2, page 177. The ministry of the word or the pastoral office is not a human institution, but an office that God himself has established. Now that really kind of surprises everybody. Because if you're going full blast congregational view, what's the pastoral office? It's an office for the sake of convenience, for the sake of order, and it's just kind of this human thing we came up with, a good arrangement, sort of like the Mormons, everybody's an elder and we just put some guys in charge. That's just, it all makes sense. But now suddenly we're told, no, it's not a human institution, it's an office, an omt, that God himself has established. And now what's the proof text? So now this gets serious. And now Walter's going full bore here because he knows this is a, this is a big point. Scripture proof. First place, we have the predictions of the prophets that God himself would give to the church, the new tea, pastors or teachers. So he starts in the Old Testament and is already mining the Old Testament looking for <coughs> predictions of God providing pastors and teachers. So we have Psalm 68. The Lord gave the word. Great was the company of those who proclaimed it. Now again, we might quibble with some of the OT exegesis here. But it don't, I'm not worried about whether this is a true proof text. I'm, my point is, what is Walter doing here? And Walter is saying, Scripture is grounding this argument. That's his whole point. Now we go to point two, second place. The divine institution of the Holy Ministry is evident from the call of the Holy Apostles into the ministry of the Word by the Son of God according to, and he goes through all of his lists, feed my sheep. Boom. So the apostles were put into the office by Christ himself. God instituted the office through his son. It's a holy office because Christ instituted it. Second point. Third place. Now we might be thinking, well, that's great for apostles. So in the third place, the divine character of the ministry of the gospel is evident from all passages in which those called mediately are represented as having been called by God himself. So in other words, what if St. Paul put you in the office? Or St. Peter? Are you really in the holy office? And now the text is Acts 20, 28. Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, episcopoi, bishops, to shepherd, poimain, the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. This is St. Paul talking to the elders from Ephesus. Who put the elders from Ephesus into the office? Well, Paul had put most of them there. Now, what does he say? among which the Holy Spirit has made you bishops. So who made them bishops? God did. So this is a key text. In other words, even those who come after Christ has ascended, even they are in the office. And is it a different office than the apostles? Well, I'm going to make the argument, and Mark Hart will, it's the same office. It's the office this office established by God to make sure that one thing happens, that the gospel is proclaimed. Okay? That's the point. So that's a key, key verse. And then we go to, um, in the fourth place, 178, the divine institution of the holy ministry is evident from the fact that the holy apostles placed themselves on an equal footing with the servants of the church who were called immediately as co-laborers in the ministry. And we have the text from 1 Peter, the elders who are among you, I exhort, I who am a fellow elder. So in other words, Peter has just elevated everybody else to the same level. And so the point that Walter's making here, and I think he's right, is that there is established by God an office. You're either in it or you're not. And if you're in it, then you have the authority of that office. And if you're not, then you don't. And who puts you in that office? The Holy Spirit, God himself. Now, how does God do that? Ordinarily, through the work of the church. And that's AC 14, Rite Vocatus, regularly called. So now we're starting to get some clarity here. So the church is going to be the one who puts you into the office, but once you're in the office, where's your authority coming from? Is it coming from the people? Or is it coming from Christ himself? And that becomes a big deal here. Because what I'm going to argue, and I want to get to this now so we don't rush it at the end, I'm going to make the case that what I think Walter is really going to come down and say is, it's not like Christ gives it to the people and the people deputize their pastor. No, Christ through the people chooses his pastor. And so once he's chosen, he has his authority 
from Christ himself. And in my thinking, this is a critical position. And it's not some kind of semantic, weird little argument. I think it's really important for a pastor to realize that his accountability is not to the people, but to Christ. And his authority is from Christ, not from the people. And think about what we even say in the divine service. I, as a called and ordained servant to the word, announce the grace of God to all of you. You're speaking on the behalf of Christ. And in the stead and on behalf of and by the authority of my Lord. You don't say, on behalf of the authority of the congregation. You see what I mean? There's a difference here. Now, the call comes to the people. So the people are involved in making this thing happen. And I think that's really what's going on when Walter's talking about the congregation has the keys. Yeah, they've got the keys. They have the right to choose their minister. Yes, they do, which is a huge argument in the small called articles. But once you've chosen your minister, to whom is he accountable? Not to you, my friend. He's accountable to Christ only. And the reason this matters is because a pastor should not go through his ministry continually looking over his shoulder, wondering what the people think of what he's saying and doing. He should be looking only one place. What's Christ think of what I'm saying and doing? What's God's word have to say about what I'm thinking and doing? That's to whom you're accountable. And I think it makes an enormous difference in the mind and the thinking of the pastor. All right? Aaron. I, in my mind, that's kind of how the church works, for, uh, the Lutheran church works right now. Because when you receive a call, the, ch the congregation can't just be like, hey, we want to get rid of this guy. Precisely. You know, we, there's Precisely. a process of... Because, see, a congregational view is that. We hire and fire whomever we want. But we aren't doing that. And so we have elements that smell congregationalist, but we have elements that aren't. And in fact, when you start talking the way Luther is talking here, he's starting to sound almost clerical, isn't he? It's like, wow, this dude's got something special. And Luther's going to say he does. And I'm not even done building my case yet. All right, James? Um, when we talk about the authority of the pastor in the congregation, um, that's authority within word and sacrament. Yes. And where I've seen some pastors seem to go wrong mm -hmm. is they extend that authority mm -hmm. into other... Like colors of chancel card. Exactly. Yeah. And, and, and so that's something that I think... Hypothetically, I mean, yes, and I, mean, I know we'll talk that, about that. that Walter could care less about the color of carpet. Well, worship. I don't know. He, he might have had more yeah. in, interest in this. But um, that's what, what you're talking about is really authority. We're talking about the spiritual authority, and we will talk about the problem of you know abusing that and what Walter will call tyrannizing in a congregation, and that's a problem. And so, and I think there is this kind of latent fear among a lot of Lutherans still of this. Well, I don't want to hair pastor kind of a thing, and they don't want that. And, but then I think, and think or, uh, too many pastors say, well, yeah, I'm not, oh, I'm not a hair pastor, I'm just one of you. And then he makes the mistake of going the other direction. And that's a problem, and I'll talk more about that. Okay. Nicholas. Um, I got a little bit confused. What is meant by congregation? Is this only the uh, congregation? Wow, that's place, another really good point. Or the whole church? Yes. If it's only the congregation in the place and they call the pastor, right. is it then possible for the other congregation to call him? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're, you're opening up a whole other issue, which is also running through this whole thing. Because, see, frequently when people talk about Luther, Walters, Kirk, and Amt, and Congregationalists, they start saying things like, only the congregation is the church. And this is a pretty strong position in our synod, and it has all kinds of interesting implications. Like, for example, when we have the Lord's Supper celebrated here on campus, we have to have a sponsor congregation because we're not the church. Now, Bruce and I have had this conversation, and he's fully in agreement with me, but he hasn't quite followed through yet. Um, because I would argue that the church is not just the congregation. This is my whole point I was making on day one in here. The church is this huge, big thing. Is the church the congregation? Yes. Is the church the whole thing? Yes. And so I'm going to make the argument that it's not just the congregation that is the real church. And I would, I, I would in fact, argue that does this community called Seminary, Concordia Seminary, does it have the marks of the church? I think it does. And I would make the case that we are the church in this place, and we can celebrate the Lord's Supper just fine. And we don't need to have a church in North Carolina giving us the green light. All right. More, we'll come back to that some more later. I, sorry to belabor the point then, but if, if we have a church 
hundreds of miles away sponsoring our Lord's Supper, mm. that I would say that ruins the idea with churches because we are not in community with them. Well, it, it's, it's missing the whole point because what that's really doing is trying to appease those who would say only the congregation is the church. Um, another place that this shows up is when you have the sense that only the congregation can issue a call. And this, in fact, was kind of standard synodical position in the early days because when seminary professors came to the seminary, they were actually called by one of the churches in St. Louis and then sent to the seminary to do their thing. But their call was at Holy Cross or Trinity or one of, you know, one of the city churches. That's where you were called and you were just kind of sent here on your, in your work. Um, and the, I thought with, uh, the seminary, well, because the seminary is not a church, you can't call. And see, we're already kind of moving away from that, but we haven't cut all those kinds of funny, weird ties. But then it goes back to Nicholas's point, which is people associate only the churches, only the, only the congregation is church. And I would say that's wrong. I would say, no. Is the synod church? Yes. Is the seminary church? Yes. So can the seminary call? Yeah, I think it can. Can the synod call? Yes, it can. Is that, is that why we kind of have, is that why we are, we receive the call and I guess have permission to be ordained from the synod? Is that the right word? We'll talk more about ordination and who's doing it and stuff yeah. like that. Yes. Okay. All right. Now. Page 178 is where I actually have my biggest concern or, he, or question mark with Walther. And because remember, Kirk and Amt is no arbitrary thing. The Synod has said, this is our position. And we're, so this is it. Now, and I can live with everything Walther's doing in this entire book, except what he, the move he makes right here on page 178, I wonder about. So, he's going for his scriptural proof of the divine institution of the office. And what would we expect? Would you expect AC5 to show up? I would, right? To make sure that the gospel is proclaimed, God has established the office of the holy ministry. Remember that? Day one, predict aunt. So what's Walter going to do? And he quotes it, that we may obtain this faith, the ministry of teaching the gospel and administering the sacraments was instituted. All right, and he goes on. This is Walter. This statement, of course, does not speak of the ministry of the word in concreto or of the pastoral office, but only the ministry of the word in abstracto of which Ludwig Hartmann, among others, rightly reminds us in his pastoral theology, and then he quotes Hartmann. The ministry of the word may be treated in two ways. First, in an abstract way, when the state or off, the office itself is being considered, as in Article 5 of the Augsburg Confession treats it. Second, in a concrete way, when the persons are considered who minister in this holy office. And if you read President Harrison's editing on this, he punts by following Marquardt, and Marquardt basically says, one wonders what Walter was thinking here and that perhaps he maybe overstated Hartman's position. Because what Walter's actually saying is that there's an abstract kind of generic ministry in the wide sense, and then there's the concrete specific ministry in each individual dude who's in the office. So when I'm a pastor, I'm concrete ministry. When we're talking about the ministry of forgiveness of sins, that would be abstract ministry. That's what Walter's getting at here. And he's trying to say that AC5 is talking about abstract and not about concrete. And I think it's exactly the opposite. Because I think precisely the point of AC5 is God wants to make sure it's concretized. And AC5 says God established the perfect omt to make sure the gospel is proclaimed. So in other words, AC5 is not ministry-wide sense. It's not, yeah, there's word and sacrament out there, go find it. It's, here's where it is. It's in this office of the holy ministry. So I think Walter is a little bit leaning in the wrong direction here on this one part. And that's just, I'll just I'll say it that way, even though I'm on tape. So, all right? Now, and we'll, we'll deal with Marquardt, because Marquardt's going to talk about this in the reading for next time. So you get to see what Mar Marquardt says about this. So watch that. All right. Now, having said that, Walter's going to make some other points, though, and come back around. So now he is actually, this is Walter again writing on page 179. And this is the right middle page. He writes, Nevertheless, the Augsburg Confession in Article 5 no doubt intends to attest also the divine institution of the pastoral office, even if only indirectly, as all commentaries of our Orthodox theologians and their comments in this article clearly show. So in other words, all the theologians all think it talks about the pastoral office. And so he's willing to admit that. Now, here's where things get really interesting. So he starts quoting Luther, and Luther really comes down hard on this stuff. So on page 181, first point is the who's doing the work. 
We're at the very top of page 181, the first line. Therefore, the laying on of hands is not a human ordinance, but God creates and ordains the ministers. And it is not the pastor who absolves you, but is the mouth and hand of God. Now, high view of the office or low view of the office? I view the office. It's the mouth of God. The pastor is the mouth of God speaking to you. It's the hand of God speaking to you. Very high view of the office. Very bottom of the page, still Luther. I myself know some who think that we need no ministers or pastors, that we merely tolerate the preachers because of custom and ancient usage. We might use their annual salaries and expenses in other and better ways, as though they, the ministers, were, as someone has said, a necessary evil. Especially some of the nobility and some smart alecks say, we have books from which we can learn what we hear you preachers say in the church. You will read the devil on your head who has taken possession of you. So, you might hear this. Well, pastor, you know, I read my own books. I don't really need you to tell me what's going on here. I can do it myself. Now, we go to page 193. And this is the whole question about ordination. Uh, this is on the same theme, so I want to pick this up right away. First full paragraph on 193. Here, Luther. Indeed, many blurt out and say, Why do we need more pastors and ministers since we can read the Bible ourselves at home? So they go their way in carnal security and do not read it at home. And here's the kicker. Or even if they do read it at home, it is neither as fruitful nor as effective as the word is efficacious when it is publicly proclaimed by the mouth of the pastor whom God has called and appointed to preach and teach it to you. That's huge. He just said that the, the Word of God is more effective when it comes from the mouth of the pastor than when you sit in your cubicle and have your personal quiet time. He just said it's more effective. And you think about how most evangelicals think nowadays. What's the real reading of the Bible? It's when I have my personal quiet time at 6.50 every morning and I got my cup of coffee and I read the Bible and I really, the Spirit speaks to me. And what Luther is saying is, that's great, wonderful, good. But the real preaching of the word is when you sit in the pew and the pastor says, thus saith the Lord to you. That's far more effective. It's fascinating. Now, again, high view of the office or low view of the office? High view. High view. Super high view. And I might even argue whether Luther's right. I'm just saying this is the point he's making. What does his attitude have to be about the word? It is coming through the pastor. This is God's appointed man. He's bringing something to it. This is clearly a high view of the office. Kevin. So is that his scriptural support there? That since God intended <coughs> this, um, it obviously must be more uh, effective coming out of me. And I think it's just even going on a real logical kind of a thing. You know, you can, I'll read it at home. Well, you don't. And even if you do, who's teaching you what it really means? Who's speaking with the authority? Who's standing in the pulpit and saying, here's what God's saying to you today? And doesn't have nearly the punch it does, as good preaching does. That's the point he's making. I think he's right. Now, the kicker, though, is, again, clearly we see Luther opening up some space here between the priests and the pastors. And the pastors are hardly, in his estimation, merely necessary evils or just deputized dudes who are doing what every one of us could do, but he just gets paid for it. There's a lot more going on here. And this is in contrast to a whole bunch of the thinking that used to go on from the kind of really heavy, full-blast congregational. Hey, we're all priests. And the pastor, he's just one of us. And in fact, the pastors would stand up and say things like, I'm just like all of you. All of you are doing the real ministry around here. I'm just the encourager. I'm just the player coach. But you're all the real ministers. I've heard this kind of stuff. Now, and it sounds like, oh, that's so cool. He's so elevating the priesthood. True. But what's he doing to himself along the way? He has just completely torn down that office, and now the average parishioner thinks he's just Joe Dude. And what's his opinion matter? He gets up in the pulpit. Who cares? And now here's the real problem. Lest you think, and I'm going to emphasize this a lot over the next few days, Lest you think I'm on some kind of ego power trip and trying to make sure my pedal still stays high so I can stay propped up there and be a cool pastor dude. That is not what I'm driving at here at all. I could care less about how your ego feels when you're the pastor. What I'm interested in is the sheep. And here's what happens. When a pastor tears down the office in an attempt to try to lift up the people, he is cheating his sheep. He's cheating his people. Because the people deserve a shepherd. The people deserve their absolution man. They deserve the guy who comes in and says, Thus saith the Lord, repent, and I forgive you. 
as a call to ordain servant of the word. They need to have a man who's in the office, who speaks with the authority of the office and the confidence of the office, and they say, there's my shepherd. There's my mouthpiece. That's God himself talking to me. And if he has so diminished himself that he's just one more idiot sheep, then they don't have their shepherd anymore. And they don't have their absolution man. You guys are called to a pastor, to a, called to a parish to be an absolution man. That's what it means to be a pastor. Don't forget it. It's the most important thing you do. And when you think, oh, I'm just one of you, and you tear down your office, you're not just diminishing yourself individually, which is fine. Who cares about you? But you're tearing down the office with you. You can't do that. Because not only are you hurting the office, but far more importantly, you're hurting the people who need that office. And you're taking away from them one of the very things God wants them to have, AC5, the predict dumped. You're just diminished it. Oh, I'm not willing to have that kind of authority. Well, then who is? Who is? If you're not willing to step into the office and fill it, then don't do it. Okay? We're clear on this? All right. So I think that's exactly what's going on here. God is clearly functioning this way. All right, so page 192, right before the page break, from the Augsburg Confession. Here are the office of the keys, which of the congregation, which the congregation possesses and by which it administers the... This is Walter commenting on this. This is actually Walter. Here are the office of the keys, which the congregation possesses and by which it administers the means of grace is identified with the power of the bishops. And to it, the obtaining of the eternal gifts is bound. This is from Article 28. But this is not because the eternal gifts of Christ's kingdom could in no ways be obtained without the administration of the means of grace by official ministers, the omst personen, but God desires ordinarily to impart these gifts to men only in this way. So the pastoral office is what God has established. Can God work apart from the pastoral office to give grace? Sure. But is that how he ordinarily operates? No. So we treasure the pastoral office for the very thing it delivers. It delivers the means of grace. That's the point he's making here. All right. Now, we're almost out of time. And the last part of this that's kind of interesting, he hits this thing about um, stealing sheep some more. But then he's also going... Um, well, page 228. I'll just call your attention to that real quick. Um, yeah, let's do that. Well, 214. I got three minutes. I'll take it. 214, last four lines. This is a, an example of editorial license. A guy named Mueller translated this from Walter's German and put it into English. And here we have a good example of Mueller pushing things in a more congregational direction than even Walter was doing. So check out this translation. This is a quoting from the, the um, power and primacy of the Pope from the Confessions. Now, everyone, even our adversaries, must confess that this command is given alike to all believers who preside over the churches, whether they are called pastors or elders or bishops. Believers is stuck in in square brackets. It's not there in Kolb Wengers. Where on the page? Sorry. Very bottom of the page. Last four lines. Okay? Last four lines. 214. Now, everyone, even our adversaries, must confess that this command is given alike. This command to preach, to teach, to absolve sins, this command is given alike to all believers who preside over the churches. This translation stuck in the word believers. Take the word believers out and translate it. Must confess that this command is given alike to all who preside over the churches. Completely changes it. Because who's presiding over the churches? Well, pastors, elders, and bishops. In other words, people in the predictomt, not all believers completely changes the message. And it takes the whole point to becoming wide ministry instead of narrow ministry. It's a problem. Now, the last thing that's also interesting here then is um, page 228, where Luther is quoted at length, just blasting people who are stealing the office. And Luther is saying, you know, cursed, you know, cursing these congregations for throwing out their pastor because the pastor's put there by God. You can't do that. And again, that kind of thinking is not consistent with the congregational view, but it's completely consistent with this. So, where does Walter actually come down? Well, that's the big question. And it seems then, the point I'm trying to make is, yes, he's pushing against this kind of position. But is he completely endorsing a congregational position? Not at all. We have a very different kind of a thing. So Walter ends up being kind of here. And when you consider the context in which he's placed where he's pushing against this, it's even more remarkable that he says the things he does about the pastoral office and the kind of way he elevates it. So in the context, you might even say he slides even a little further this way. Kind of interesting. Now, 
For next time, I've got you reading an essay by Dr. Nagel, and I want you to take careful time reading that. Make sure you read that well. Um, it's fascinating, the moves he makes. And he's going to help kind of bring a nice, neat ribbon to this whole discussion about who's really got the authority. Are we Congregationalists? Are we Clericalists? How are we supposed to understand this? How are we going to sort this out? The last part of Walter that we didn't talk about today, which is kind of the sad thing, is he um, makes the move, and he's responsible for this, of grounding every work in the church in the pastoral office. And he wants to say that everything that goes on in the church is part of the pastoral office. So including deacons and Sunday school superintendents and teachers. And he even talks about sextons, people who are basically what would be modern day trustees or business managers or property managers. He makes that move. Um, I'm not crazy about that, but we'll talk about that another time at greater length. All right. Enjoy the rest of the day, guys. We'll see you next week.